Everybody and welcome back. My name is Manga Rider, and this video to me has been a long time coming. Some of you guys may already know who I am and know what I did to get myself into this show, but to the new people that haven't been involved in my quite long history, I was the guy that made a series of videos that were titled Everything Wrong with Sonic X over on my Manga Artist channel, a series that took me over two years to finish. It gained a bit of traction and overall became one of my most popular series, but recently, a bunch of those episodes are now blocked by YouTube Worldwide because of copyright. And knowing that I by no means can fight back, especially to something like anime copyright, I made the decision to just private all the videos. Meaning that Everything Wrong with Sonic X, a series that ate up two years of my life and resulted in me feeling the textbook example of the phrase, I won but at what cost, is now gone from the public eye, never to be seen again. And this left me feeling a little... conflicted. I've kind of grown to have a like-hate relationship with my series as a whole. The only videos I ended up kind of remembering were episodes 4, 5, 6, and 8. And the other videos range from being forgettable to just downright embarrassing because of all the stuff I got wrong. Not to mention, I'm not the biggest fan of the character I decided to put on. I came off as too much of an asshole, and my sins range from being actual critiques to just poorly constructed jokes. But, rather than wallow in self-pity and curse the world for my downfalls, I realized that this is the golden opportunity to actually go over Sonic X in all the ways I wanted to go over it for over two years. So I'm making this video to just make peace with myself. Everything from here on out is going to be my completely genuine thoughts on the show. So, we have 8 arcs to go through, so let's not waste any more time and get this started with the New World Saga, which are episodes 1 to 13. How do they know about Chaos Control? Sonic swearing was the highlight of this episode. A lot of people should be dead after this attack. Chris begins his legacy of getting himself into trouble. Yay. Knuckles is a chaotic, repetitive dumbass with nice Spanish music. Nobody questions the sudden appearance of a robot in school. Sonic getting fires for cream saved this episode. Mobians can survive in space, but can't survive water. Okay. Sonic fixing Amy's bracelet was adorable. This episode's comedy was out of the park. Rouge and Topaz share pretty decent chemistry. Those screams though. But, but how do they have a Chaos Emerald after episode 10? Sonic is durable. Also just Knuckles and Rouge. Sonic X's first 13 episodes, to me, contain a lot of the problems I have with the series as a whole, in addition to introducing some of the best aspects of X, which I will tackle first. In these specific episodes, they do a mixed job of characterizing the cast that we already know. Sonic in these 13 episodes is shown as being a very laid-back and easy-going guy with a large love for sleeping and taking it easy. This is one of the main things that make him different from the rest of the cast. While other characters love being in each other's company and doing wacky hijinks together, Sonic would rather just lay down and take a nap. He takes every moment he has alone as a chance to just wind down and take in the air, which shows Sonic as being quite happy with just relaxing and enjoying life at his own pace, which for a character that runs at Sonic speed all the time is actually quite a nice touch. But when life tells him to stop being a nature-loving hippie and someone needs his help, he rarely ever thinks twice and immediately goes out to help them. And in terms of kindness and being a good friend, Sonic is packed to the brim with that. Shown by him spending an entire episode to just get some flowers for Cream, fixing Amy's bracelet after it got destroyed, and him being very supportive of Tails and Chris. Also him knowing Cream so well that he knows that she makes flower crowns for people she loves. Oh. That is too pure. The series so far is showing a nicely balanced take on Sonic's character, which ends up making him quite likable. Tails is a brave and smart kid with a lot of knowledge of technology in the Chaos Emeralds, which basically leaves him as being the explainer of everything for the audience. This had the chance to make Tails a non-character, and unfortunately, he kind of is. His personality traits aren't shown at their best in this arc, I'm sad to say. He has his moments with his intelligence and his fighting with Eggman, but he really was just there to explain what the heck was going on. Amy in this series is Sonic obsessed to the next level. Practically every moment she's a few meters away from Sonic, she just becomes the desperate fangirl that cannot take a hint, and while it's not to a point where it's insufferable, it can still be a bit grating. And it's also kind of funny that if this show was released in today's times, Amy would immediately be called a simp. Though, 
but I must say there are some pretty good moments for her in this arc, with her making Sonic a bracelet, which was very cute, and really showing what she's made of when the robot destroys it. You know shit's going down when fucking Eggman is shitting himself. Cream in Sonic X is just the purest thing ever, there is literally nothing wrong with her, and when people piss her off, they commit domestic terrorism, and I'm sorry they deserve to die. Jokes aside, Cream is a very lovable cute character. Her cuteness isn't too overbearing, which I greatly appreciate. Also, cheese. That's the cutest fucking thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Eggman, I think, takes a bit of a hit in this show as he comes off as more of a nuisance as opposed to an actual threat to the characters. He does have his moments like him trying to shake Chris off his ship and being able to convince Knuckles, but everything else comes off as either boring or very, very stupid. Eggman trying to brainwash kids with a robot in school is easily one of his dumbest plans to date. However, I gotta say, Knuckles is so well done here. He contains most of this arc's comedy. His sheer level of spitefulness towards Sonic is consistently funny, with him being very easily annoyed by Sonic's taunting, while also knowing when to quit it for the greater good. His tryhard lone wolf attitude comes off as hilariously cute, and leads to the start of some great banter he has at Rouge. I swear, these two are the OTP. And despite him being way too gullible for his own good, I think it makes Knuckles a very endearing character. Also, his responsibility and protecting the Master Emerald is a great factor that helps differentiate him from the others. He's easily the most likable out of the cast in his wild stupidity. I think that's the best way to describe him. With the main cast out of the way, let's talk about the new characters. Sonic and the gang in this series have to live and interact with a bunch of people, which instantly sounds like a turnoff if it wasn't for the fact that these characters are mostly quite likable. Ella is a great mother figure with a good amount of sass. Chuck is the very nice, crazy old man with a kind heart. Topaz is very easily flustered and is a very very good character to help flesh out Rouge. Chris's parents are those too busy to pay attention to their son kinds of parents, but always have their heart in the right place and really do care about their son. And I think that everyone can agree that Tanaka is the goat of the Sonic franchise. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this perfect specimen of a man. Now in terms of Chris, he's not unlikable in this arc. There is one moment in episode 7 where he comes off as very harsh to his mother and there are some moments where he either gets himself into trouble or just didn't need to be there, but in these 13 episodes, he's fine. He's inoffensive. For now. So in terms of the cast, Sonic X does a mostly good job at making sure you get to like these characters before the show gets into the stories and the action. Where this arc falls a lot for me, however, is the storytelling. This arc contains a lot of stupid plot points. This ranges from mild logical inconsistencies like a giant robot emerging from knee-deep water, the people knowing about Sonic's name when it was never said prior, the soldiers entering Eggman's base at the top but start at the bottom floor, Eggman getting into his base without seeing the army of soldiers patrolling around it, Tubble suddenly having a character arc where he cares about helping people despite being apathetic to them before, completely off screen. I don't know, that kinda would have been cool to see, but hey, just came straight out of left field. Alright, to the absolutely unforgivable stupidity of other scenes. A few examples include Chris deciding to wait for Sonic to tell them about the attack happening in episode 3 rather than just instantly telling the Sonic crew about what was going on. The school, the police, and the government not questioning the sudden appearance of a giant robot in a school? What? The government, manually hacking into Eggman's computer, leading him to his enemies, and possibly helping him to get a Chaos Emerald in order to lure him out of his base. Not even once considering what might happen if Eggman comes back with a Chaos Emerald? And Eggman stealing a Chaos Emerald straight out of Tails' hand, and no one sees it or does anything to stop it. And the worst part is, this stuff is quite tame compared to the rest of the show. Later on, some of these plot points are just gonna get dumber. There's also two plot holes that I can remember, like how do they all know about chaos control? Why is this suddenly a thing? It's just never explained. And how when the carrot do they have a chaos emerald in episode 12 after episode 10? But all in all, the New World Saga was fine. The episodes range from being funny, semi-decent, to just flat out forgettable. If I didn't watch this arc again, I wouldn't have really remembered anything from these episodes, besides some pretty good jokes and nice characterization for a few of the cast. And with that ending of the New World Saga over and done with, let's jump to the Chaos Emerald arc, which contain episodes 14 to 26. This anime should have been about Helen! We were robbed, people! 
Jabbing at the drill's uselessness doesn't make it less useless. <laughs> Sonic almost dying from drowning was a good running gag. Yabanji. This episode's main villains and robots were really stupid. Sonic being lovey-dovey should have been an instant- OH GOD! <laughs> Oh, this one made me laugh way too many times. This episode had two good moments. Everything else? Eh. I guess the Chow were adorable, so that's a win? Chaos Emeralds start becoming very inconsistent in this absolute bore fest. <laughs> this one was actually pretty funny. Life lessons were hurt by Knuckles and Chris being dumb. Sonic being alive after that beating was the true twist. Well then, uh... That was a bit of an improvement. Now that all the characters have been established and the stories can get more interesting, Sonic X just dives right in with a fantastic first episode, and then goes back to be meh for the rest of it. Jokes aside, the Chaos Emerald arc is, in a lot of areas, a massive improvement over the last saga, especially in its writing. There's a lot more different stories going around this time, with some episodes not having Eggman be a threat at all, and oh look, Nightmare Fuel! There's a lot more characterization for some of the cast, like Chris, Knuckles, Tonica, by default, and especially Mr. Stewart. And what's great about this arc is that the comedy is now tolerable. The jokes are even often funny. Instead of the constant deep sigh or eye roll I mostly did for the last arc, I actually found myself laughing at a lot of the jokes here. There's a lot of really good roasts, a lot of great build-ups, a good amount of well-done quick subversions of expectations, and so many punchlines that once or twice left me in tears I was laughing so hard, with episode 20 being without a doubt the best episode of this arc. Episode 20 is easily one of the funniest episodes of this entire series. The amount of great jokes that have a masterfully crafted build-up is staggering. Sonic's constant fear of water? Check. Sonic manipulating his friends so he can get off the boat? Check. Jokes involving the old people? Check. And Ella being betrayed by Boken. <laughs> Mwah. This episode had me have to pause the episode because I was laughing so much the first time. Though, the fourth wall breaks really need to stop being so dragged out. They're funny in quick bursts, but lose all their appeal once they're the focus of the scene. Sure, there are some bits that are very forced and sacrifice the episode's pacing in exchange for a quick laugh, like 90% of the jokes involving Eggman plus episode 18 and 23. But when the jokes are good, they're really fucking good. The comedic writing has definitely gotten a lot better. But what surprised me the most about this arc is that there are some instances where the show actually drops the comedy for a bit and delivers some very heartful scenes. These moments are where Sonic X is at its best for me. Sure, I love myself a good joke like any other person, I'm not a monster, but when a show actually tackles some themes that would usually go unnoticed, like for example loneliness, that's when I see a show being a lot better than other comedies. The best examples that I could find in this arc is the scene where they made me actually care about Chris and his unwillingness to let Sonic go in episode 25, where Mr. Stewart pulls Chris aside and talks to him about his inner conflict. Everything about this scene from from the pacing to the voice acting was really good. This scene masterfully tackled a core part of Chris's character, his friendship with Sonic, and how much Sonic means to him, all in the span of about a minute. And these lines of dialogue, there are two Chris's. One Chris feels like he has to let Sonic return to his world, the other Chris doesn't want to part with Sonic, each Chris condemns the other Chris. That delicious candy will eventually melt and disappear, but the memory of its great taste remains. That's what growing up is all about. This is probably the best reassurance of letting someone go that I've probably ever heard. This scene was not only able to make Mr. Stewart and Chris developed characters, but it actually tells a surprisingly deep life lesson without it seeming forced at all. You may have to let someone go, but the great memories you had with them will live on. Damn, that's... Ooh, that's some deep shit. There is also a lot of development for the character Helen and her entire family in episode 14, where in under 30 seconds, the show managed to develop Helen's dad more than most of the main cast combined. Sonic X, when you actually try, you can make some great stuff. Why don't you do this consistently? Why do some of your episodes have so much stupidity in them? Yeah, you think that a small handful of deep moments and great jokes would blind me from even more stupidity that the show introduced? <laughs> well, think again. Let's talk about the bad stuff. Episode 18, 
What the honest hot sauce was episode 18? From the horrid pacing of the episode, the super forced environmental message that has a subtlety of Japan after the second nuke, cardboard corporate villains building a dam in the middle of a savanna that's nowhere near a single drop of water, you tried to be self-aware about it but it's not cute, to the absolute stupidest design flaw of one of Eggman's robots, this episode was an absolute mess and is a golden example of Sonic X's horrible filler. Fuck dude, Eggman committing reptilian genocide was the only good part. I'm not even joking. The president's aide somehow getting into contact with Eggman and negotiating with him to see if Eggman could convince Sonic to join the race in episode 21. Keep in mind, Eggman is probably the most wanted man alive right now, and never once does it cross the aide's mind that this might be an absolutely terrible idea. Why this happened? Just fries my brain trying to make sense of it. Not to mention that this episode shows that the race was extremely disorganized since the president wasn't at the finish line from the start. It introduces the most painfully unfunny robot plus this unholy demon and that Sonic can now surpass the speed of light. This shit is not the speed of sound by any stretch. The general public always getting their hands on Chaos Emeralds and selling them off as jewelry even though they belong to Sonic and the government is hell-bent on making sure Eggman doesn't get them so it just makes us even dumber. Oh but trust me this gets worse later on, just wait till Adventure 2. The Sonic gang somehow knowing that Knuckles has won Chaos Emerald even though there is no evidence of anything they could use to contact him about it. How do you guys know this? Sonic surviving this absolute beating from E99. Look, I don't care how strong Sonic is, he should be dead. Chris and Knuckles trusting Eggman that he's on their side. I don't even have to explain this one, honestly. Is this the face of someone you can trust? Knuckles, why did you fall for this shit again? And the constant additional powers of the Chaos Emeralds. This one specifically drives me up the wall. In episode 23, the show decides that the Chaos Emeralds need to be a bit more than just magic rocks that power machines and dye your hair blonde. So, they add a new plot point that explains the following. If two Chaos Emeralds have been away from each other for a while that are in close proximity to each other, the Emeralds would, and I quote, repel each other violently and unleash powerful electromagnetic waves. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. That's a nice little concept. It's a nice little bit of lore. But tell me this, Sonic X. Why is it that this has never happened when two emeralds were close to each other before? Because there has been a few instances of emeralds being exposed in very close proximity to each other, but nothing happened. Prime example being, episode 10. So what's going on? Also, wasn't it a plot point that Chaos Emeralds attract other Chaos Emeralds? If that's the case, then why would they attract each other to their energy if they're just going to repel the moment the other emerald gets too close? It just, huh? This addition to how the emeralds work massively overcomplicates something that doesn't need to be complicated. I get why they're doing this, they don't want the Chaos Emeralds to be just MacGuffins that the characters are trying to collect, but unfortunately, that's exactly what the Chaos Emeralds are. They are just powerful objects that when gathered turns the person into a blonde. Nothing more, nothing less. So can we please stop adding all this stupid shit to them. They literally only use this plot point twice, those two examples being in this episode and episode 25. Other than that, it's never brought up again, because they knew how tedious this edition would be. Sometimes a MacGuffin is just a MacGuffin. Please learn to accept that. Now that I have said all of my likes and dislikes, despite having a lot of new stupid editions and the occasional forgettable or really bad episode, the Chaos Emerald Saga is still much better than the last one. With a lot more great jokes, the addition of more serious scenes, and a rather touching ending, Sonic X got more stuff right this time around because of the increased amount of heart and comedy. All in all, not too bad. The next arc is going to be quite interesting because Sonic X decided that they would try and adapt some of the games into the anime, with the two adventure games getting the most spotlight. So now it's time to discuss adaptations with the Chaos Arc, which are episodes 27 to 32. The Beginning of the Disaster should have been episode 1's title. Did you fall asleep during episode 27? Here's a recap. They are really rushing this, aren't they? Whoa, this really needs more episodes. Wait, how does that get here? Babu. That was it? That was so lame. Holy heavenly cabbage, this arc was 
boring. All right, let's get the two things I liked out of the way, I guess. Firstly, I loved how well animated Chaos was. He really was where most of the budget went for this arc. The water effects are done very well, his movements did great at showing the very alien nature of him, and the animation on Perfect Chaos from the movements to the expressions were superb. And two, this arc helped solidify my liking towards Mr. Stewart. He has really nice development in this arc. But aside from those two things, everything else took a massive hit in quality. I think the reason this arc is so bad is just because of the amount of episodes that was given to this story. This arc was given six episodes, just barely over two hours to tell the whole story from Adventure 1. And in doing this, it resulted in this story having to rush everything in this saga, which completely killed any stakes or emotion this story used to have in the original game. Characters have absolutely no time to properly develop, which leads to them being cardboard cutouts that just help the story go forward, as opposed to feeling like these characters are getting involved properly in the story. This lack of character development results in character arcs either being way too quick, coming out of nowhere, or just never resolved. Gamma went from being an interesting character that you naturally grew to like thanks to his development in the game, to a character that forcefully resolves his entire character's story in just one episode. He gains his sentience, leaves Eggman, kills Delta and Epsilon, with Epsilon being nearly completely off screen, and kills Beth in a fight that barely lasts a minute, leading to me feeling absolutely nothing when he poofs out of existence. His once great and endearing character story was ruined. Tails' development into a much braver character made sense in the game, but here? Him suddenly feeling like he can't do anything without Sonic doesn't make any sense, because in the last two arcs, he showed plenty of bravery and showed he was quite capable of taking care of himself. So not only was this plot point way too rushed, it was also completely pointless. The shortness of the runtime also calls for plot convenience to be kicked into overdrive, with the Master Emerald and Chaos Emerald hunts being way too fast, to call story hitting none of their marks, characters just randomly finding Chaos Emeralds, be it off screen or on, and the cast acting exceptionally stupid in order to have Chaos get all the Emeralds to turn into one-headed King Ghidorah. Because of Chris and the new characters, the studio had to change parts of the plot in order to fit them in, and in doing so, certain parts of the adventure story are either just completely skimmed over, like Zero who has one thing to the story and is never an issue again, Zeta not even being mentioned until Gamma was going on a sibling massacre, why does deleting Eggman's master memory shit cause them to die but Gamma's fine, and the Egg Viper appearing for not even a minute long fight scene, or change for something else in order to make the story still hit their marks while trying to add the new characters in naturally, but fails miserably. Take the lead up to the climax for example. In the game, Knuckles brought the 6 Chaos Emeralds he got from Chaos 6 back to Angel Island along with the Master Emerald. Chaos and Eggman head to the island, to which Chaos betrays Eggman, steals the Chaos Emerald, and makes a run for the last one. After one final flashback telling the audience what happened to the Echidnas, Sonic and Tails make their way to the location of the last Emerald emerald, but they got there too late, causing Chaos to naturally steal the last emerald and obtain his kaiju form. In the anime, Knuckles isn't even on Angel Island, but is instead with Sonic, Tails, and Eggman in Mystic Ruins, Chaos betrayed Eggman too quickly, with the sixth Chaos Emerald held in a sack. Chris then proceeds to SHOUT for Knuckles, while holding up the last emerald for all the world to see, shockingly gets caught, causing Sonic and the gang to rescue him, leading to Knuckles dropping the sack which falls down a crack and Chaos's transformation begins right on track. One story hit its climax pretty damn well, the other hit its climax because of brain dead incompetence. Which one has the most weight here? Say what you want about Sonic Adventure's storytelling and its flaws, but at least the game mostly managed to competently tell its story, and the characters fucked up due to just really bad circumstances. Adventure told its story in a way that made the narrative hit all of its marks without the atrocious amount of plot convenience that the anime used because of the garbage runtime. And because of this recipe of stupid character moments and rushed story all being condensed into a 6 episode arc, Sonic X lost a lot of what made Sonic Adventure adventure so memorable in the first place. I am glad that the show actually went out of its way to show the aftermath of all the destruction rather than just skipping it at the start of the next arc, but overall, I found the Chaos Saga to just be way too cluttered, way too rushed, and above all, way too boring. But what about the next arc? Well, after the boring cluster onion that was the Chaos Saga, it's now time to review the arc that covered the adventures of Sonic Adventure 2, the Shadow Saga, which contain episodes 33 to 38.
The humans turned on Sonic way too quickly. You guys are the absolute worst. Chris runs right into trouble again. Yeah, they fixed one plot hole, so that was nice. Four kids ruined this soldier's moment. Woohoo! Live and learn, baby! Woohoo! <laughs> If the last arc's biggest problem was that it was way too rushed and boring, this arc's biggest problem is that it is too frustratingly stupid. Alright, look, I'm not gonna play dumb with you. We all know of the most infamous plot points of Adventure 2 by now. Prison Island keeping Shadow in cryogenic storage even though they know how dangerous he is, is begging for a disaster. Giving the mad scientist a computer while he was in prison after killing his daughter and destroying his plans on the Ark was a smooth brain moment. Sonic having the sudden ability to do chaos control and on top of that with a fake emerald shouldn't be possible and makes no sense. And the fact that no one thought to check the arc after Gerald said his very detailed plans to a camera seconds before his live leak style execution, and just leaving it there and not moving it somewhere far into space, is mind numbingly dumb. So the anime tries to fix some of the holes in the story while trying to add the new characters in. But by trying to fix some plot holes from the original game, Sonic X ended up creating two to three more due to the fact that A, Sonic and the gang come from a different world this time, and B, Sonic X still contains nearly all the same plot holes from the original game in addition to more. Many examples include Eggman finding out he was born in the human world. This raises way too many questions as to how he even got to Mobius in the first place. This twist just kind of pops out of nowhere, and what's even worse is that it's never expanded upon. The anime decides to just, you know, drop this complete bombshell onto the audience and just moves on like it was nothing. If you are not going to expand on this very crucial detail of Eggman's character, then what was even the point? Sonic cannot steal a Chaos Emerald from the humans in this adaptation because the emeralds don't belong to the humans in the first place. So the humans suddenly taking full ownership and arresting Sonic for allegedly taking something that is already his, in addition to knowing that the Chaos Emeralds are the one thing that Sonic and the gang need to get back home, is the biggest amount of mental gymnastics I've ever seen. Also, Chaos Emeralds range from being guarded in a high security base to being placed in an art museum? I'm sorry. Sorry. What? What's even better is that this arc introduces the beginning of the humans instantly starting to distrust Sonic, despite there being absolutely no valid reasons to start now. Why would they think that Sonic would just flip on a dime and start terrorizing their city when he saved them from a water god barely a week ago? What would cause Sonic to have such a radically different view towards these guys? These characters go from being forgettable in earlier arcs to just flat out unlikable? Guys, you are destroying the village more than Sonic is at this point. What are you doing? <laughs> Oh gee, sucks for you, man who is the president, lives in the White House, has tons of money, and was perfectly fine while Perfect Chaos was rampaging the city while everyone else was either homeless, dying, or dead. Did I ever say that I never liked his character? There is also this new plot point of there being a secret organization of Gun that is trying to conceal what happened 50 years ago on the Ark, but... This plot point leads to absolutely nothing, and it just doesn't make sense considering how big of a role Gun plays in this saga. Okay then. Now listen. I know that Sonic being mistaken for Shadow has become a tired running joke in the fanbase, and there is evidence of this making sense in the game. Shadow was found rampaging a place at night. Even though you could see a very clear shot of him in the camera, that's probably just the game's is aging. I can extend an olive branch in the context of the game, I can deal with it. It makes a bit of sense. I'll give this, I'll give the fanbase this. But the anime, no, absolutely refuse, no. I cannot believe that even after seeing Shadow right next to the camera in a lit room, I've got to inform you, everyone still has their doubts on whether or not it was Sonic in that footage. You know guys, there's people who respect Sonic and would, you know, praise his every actions and stuff like that. You sure forgot the one tiny, tiny, minuscule little detail that Sonic the Hedgehog is fucking blue. Oh, you son of a- But the most egregious plot point that the anime decided to introduce was how Sonic got arrested. In the game, this plot point was simple and to the point. Sonic fought off a gun robot, he encountered Shadow, 
got a bit of a one-two. Shadow managed to escape in time. Gun surrounds Sonic, and then they arrest him. Sonic had no- uh, Jesus Christ. Sonic had no witnesses to help prove his innocence, so he couldn't fight back, and thus, he was cuffed and arrested. The end. Moving on. In the anime, however, rather than being alone while fighting Shadow, Chris and Chuck were around while all of this was going down. They all had a very clear view of Shadow. They now know he is a thing that exists in this time and space. So when he escapes via Chaos Control and the cops come in to arrest Sonic, do they tell the cops about what happened? Do they try to tell him that Sonic is innocent? Do they do anything to defend Sonic from this obviously false accusation? No. They don't do that. They do... nothing. They actually tell Sonic not to fight the cops and go with them to be arrested. In the game, Sonic had no witnesses. No one could defend him. In the anime, Sonic was arrested because no one had the nerve to open their mouths and defend him. I know that Adventure 2's story is far from being perfect, but to be fair, at least some of it made sense. At least some of it was tolerable. This, this is inexcusable. Sonic was oh, you little fucking turnip. Amy. Did the writers of this episode just do it out of order? Sonic, you are lying. And on top of all this stupidity, this arc has so many dumb moments. I swear to God. Gerald's password to access Project Shadow was Maria. How did no one figure this out after 50 years? I know it may have seemed obvious, but come on. Really? It didn't even give it a shot. The Egg Golem, which was like pretty cool in the game, is now just... It just really overstays its welcome, and the way Boken's defeated is just... Uh, it's so fucking dumb. And the way Chris and Tonika manage to get onto Prison Island, because they just have to be there. I can't even begin to explain how stupid this plot point is, just... <sighs> Gun is just competent. And thus concludes my probably too long rant about the negatives of this arc. So with those out of the way, I will say that despite the glaring flaws the Shadow Saga has, it fixed a lot of issues I had with the Chaos Arc. For one, it's paced a million times better, despite having the same amount of episodes. There's actually only a few cases of filler that's in each episode, and it does get straight to the point when it comes to telling the plot out of Adventure 2, which I was really happy with. Despite a lot of the changes they had to make in order for the new characters to fit in naturally, this time, the changes weren't so bad. It actually made the story on par as it was in the game, even though a lot of plot points were changed to a point where it's almost unrecognizable. The fact that it managed to hit the same beats, and in some cases make those beats even better, is attention to writing that I genuinely appreciate. But what stood out the most to me in this arc specifically, is that it contains a small handful of moments that I genuinely think are great and are some of the best examples of Sonic X having very good writing. These golden little nuggets include 1. The side plot of Maria's killer Gun was always seen as being this large boogeyman throughout the Sonic lore up to this point, so no one really got any development besides Gun Bad, and all that the soldiers were seen as were just pretty much drones with no real humanity to begin with. So the anime decided that a good way to change up the plot of the game is to find the soldier who actually offed Maria, and why he did it. Giving Maria's killer a name was already a really interesting move as it helps humanize the soldiers of Gun a lot more, and the build up towards actually seeing the soldier was handled very effectively, with little lines like him being very alone even though he has family, and that despite his age, he can still pack quite a good punch. But when the show finally got to his interview, it cuts to a flashback explaining what happened, and it was how this moment was done that makes me truly appreciate it. Rather than painting painting the soldiers as being cold-hearted monsters, this scene is shown from the soldiers' perspective. This allows the audience to understand that the soldiers were ordered by the government to close down the facility under the impression that an accident occurred on the Ark, but they all knew that that was just an excuse. The government was hiding something. 
and they didn't want it to get out. So despite the soldiers knowing that this was bullshit, because they were really sent there to just erase the evidence of the experiments that took place on the Ark, the soldiers still complied because they didn't dare question their authorities. That's actually really clever, because soldiers are raised to not question their authorities. Not too bad so far. When they got to the Ark, all they could see were weird experiments of different creatures, which triggered this soldier's paranoia that this is what the rumors were talking about. Research on eternal life and creating the ultimate life form. This unfortunately is when the soldier sees Maria, who runs away. With Maria running away and locking the door behind her, the soldier makes chase under the order of not allowing any of the staff to escape and sees Maria holding onto a lever in front of a tube containing what looks like to be an experiment. Putting two and two together, the soldier, under the impression that Maria plans to free this hideous life form, shoots away the lock and orders her to step away from the lever, gun pointed straight at her back. When she refuses, the soldier, despite giving her all the chances in the world to stop, shot Maria in hopes to just stop her, but ended up accidentally killing her. He goes on to say that the people who resisted were killed, the mission was over after they managed to seal away the prototype of the ultimate life form, and that the government covered the whole thing up as just being an accident. With the whole story of what really happened being told from his perspective, the anime allows a little bit of time to show you how much the soldier regretted what he did. All he wanted was to protect the peace, but in doing so, he ended up accidentally killing a little girl as a last ditch effort to stop her. Not only did this scene show that her death was truly an accident, but it also showed that her killer was simply just another soldier who was following orders and is completely traumatized by what he's done. The way this scene was presented was done amazingly. When you see the flashback, there's no massive score to build up the scene, it's done in mostly silence, which did really well in building up the anxiety when the soldier is pointing his gun at Maria, begging her to stop, and it made the actual gunshot far more impactful. Sonic X didn't need to do this. They could have glossed over this plot point and just moved on, but the fact that they did was really impressive. This scene is hands down the best part of this arc, and one of the best scenes in the whole show. 2. Shadow's character arc was done much better here than it was in the game. This chapter spent a lot of time on Shadow specifically, and showing that he sees Maria practically everywhere he goes. And one of the best changes they made to his story was changing up the scene of him being sent to Earth by Maria. In the game, there was practically no noise in the room, so him misinterpreting her makes no sense unless you play the Japanese version of the game. In the show, however, there are explosions everywhere, so there was no way that Shadow would have been able to hear Maria's last words. Shadow not being able to hear what Maria was saying when she sent him to Earth, in addition to the added explosions and chaos, now gives his character much more reason to assume that Maria wants humanity to be destroyed, which is only then exemplified with the reveal that Gerald completely controls Shadow's memories. For all he knows, those memories could be fake, those events probably never had him in them. But he doesn't care. Shadow still wants to carry out Maria's wish because he wants to make her happy. That's all he wants. It's what he believes he was made to do. And those memories of the times he spent with her are all that he has left. Without them, Shadow has no purpose. He's just a shell with no end goal. So when he finally realizes what Maria actually wanted, his motivation to fix his wrongdoings makes all the sense in the world, meaning that him doing everything he can to save the Earth, even if it meant sacrificing himself, was all a very natural end to his character. The changes that Sonic X made to this character arc was done so fucking well. Also, seeing Shadow cry when this realization happens is something else. Ugh. My heartstrings were strangled! And three, to tie this story into a handsome little bow, the anime went out on a high note, with having the final battle be played to the song Live and Learn, which just made this scene so much fucking better. And once the final climax is over, the ending to the story is far slower and much more sedimental, as this time, 
you don't see what happened to Shadow. It was all around. A really good ending to this arc. And for Tanaka's the best, Tanaka's the fucking GOAT! So, when I look back, this arc, while containing easily some of the dumbest moments in this anime, has a lot of little moments that make the annoying parts slightly worth getting through. The good moments were really great, and the bad moments were either boring or flat out infuriating. All in all, the Shadow Saga, while an upgrade from the last arc, still has a long way to go when it comes to consistently good quality. We're slowly getting out of the bad stuff in the anime, so let's see if the next arc keeps that spark going. Let's take a look at the Egg Moon Saga, which are episodes 39 to 41. A start to a good few mini-arcs before the grand finale. My original story Shadows is being made over on Webtoon. Head on over there for chapters every month, and while you're at it, subscribe, leave a rating, and some feedback. I'd really appreciate it. Finally, some good fucking comedy. Everyone is so fucking dumb. What can I say except it's dog shit? Okay, Sonic X. What are you doing? How can you have such a good first episode and then give me two episodes of some of the most blood boiling, stupid bullshit I've ever had to experience? Why? What did I do to deserve this? Is there some kind of cardinal sin that I have to confess to that will save me from the horribleness that was this absolute dumpster fire of a saga? Why was this arc so fucking bad? I'm kinda getting to a point in this video where I'm starting to almost repeat my criticisms, so considering how short this arc is, I'll just boil down my analysis to a few sentences. The humans should have never trusted Eggman. When has he ever done anything good for this planet? What made you decide to suddenly start trusting him after he's A, fought your military multiple times and won, B, unleashed a water god onto your city, leaving it completely destroyed and then just leaving, or C, broke into your top seeker base, stole your most seeker weapon, blew up the top seeker base a little while later, and blew up part of your fucking moon as a mere threat to make you guys surrender? I could understand if they tried to pull this shit around the first arc, but I after over 30 episodes of Eggman's bullshit, this is just ridiculous. Also, you guys have scientists, right? How did you hear Eggman say that the moon is not moving and not think that that's a little bit odd? How did you not figure this out before the nature-loving blue hippie? It just bothers me so much that despite having mountains of evidence to the contrary, the humans just decide that Eggman is good now, and don't see his sudden redemption as anything but suspicious. Everything that happens to you from here on out is completely deserved. You're all dead to me. The comedy is 9 times out of 10. Awful. The jokes either don't hit their marks or go on for way too long to a point where you are aware that the people making this story had to add in filler to keep the runtime going. Otherwise, this arc would have just been one episode. And everyone distrusting Sonic for the second time after everything he has done to keep you guys alive, from the maniacal scientist with a boner for domination, the Godzilla monster to the space Godzilla monster, and after everything you fucking been through with this nature-obsessed stoner, is now just plain cruel. The fact that you guys even need to question Sonic's motives when it comes to destroying the towers, it's, it's so horrible. How Sonic has not snapped at any of you up to this point, it's just beyond me. You dumb fucking cretin, you fucking fool, absolute fucking buffoon, you bumbling idiot, fuck you. However, there is a silver lining to this saga. There is one episode that saves this entire arc from being inexcusably bad. Because in episode 39, Sonic X introduces Espio, Charmy, and Vector, better known as the Chaotix. And you have no idea how much I love these characters? The Chaotix is where Sonic X's comedy completely shines in every aspect. I honestly can't tell you how much fun it is to just watch these guys work together and bounce off of each other. It's like comedic gold. Here's why. 
When a character in Sonic X tells a joke, the reaction is usually a deep sigh, a small chuckle, or a genuine laugh from me, because the characters that tell these jokes aren't usually made to be the comic relief. So hearing someone like Amy suddenly making a fourth wall joke out of nowhere just comes off as very jarring. With the main cast, many of the jokes range from being genuinely funny to just being way too forced, even to a point where some jokes drag on for way too long, completely destroying the once great punchline. This is pretty much how I would describe a lot of Eggman's comedy. He to me is where the comedy is at its worst. But this is where the chaotix fix this issue. When these characters were introduced, the show made it crystal clear from the very start that these guys serve one purpose and one purpose alone to be the show's comic relief. So when the chaotix tell a joke, be it fourth wall breaking, banter, self-awareness, or a weirdly planned scheme, the jokes automatically become more funny because comedy is what you come to expect from these characters. So you're much more inclined to laugh at the absurdity as opposed to pausing and questioning the absurdity. And they succeed in this department so well. Their comedic timing is incredible, their personalities work amazingly off each other, and the sense of bantery camaraderie the three of them have is just contagious. Every joke has this beautiful build-up that lands with a hilarious punchline, making the Chaotix have easily some of the funniest jokes of the series. There have been episodes in the past that have made me chuckle, even laugh, but nowhere near as much as the Chaotix. And what's even better is that the Chaotix don't overstay their welcome. Once that episode is done, you don't see them again until a while later. The show knows that their humor, if they stayed around, would get annoying eventually. So to avoid that, they hold them off until they feel like it would be fun to add them back in, making every single time they are on screen an absolute treat. You would not believe how happy I'd be to find out that an episode has the Chaotix in it. It's like Christmas came early. The episode that actually had them in them overall was also a really fun time, with the introduction of Creams' mother giving us possibly some of the most wholesome shit in the whole show. But aside from that fantastic episode, the Egg Moon Saga to me is definitely one of X's weaker arcs. It carried over a lot of the problems I had with the Shadow Saga and condensed them into two episodes of absolute misery. Play me once, I'm mad. Play me twice, now you're pushing it. With that quick review of the shortest arc done, it's now time for a slightly longer season. The Emerald Saga, which contain episodes 42 to 46. Oh yes, Japanese culture. Chris's parents are absolute chads. Nah, just skip this one, you ain't missing much. Yes, let the comedy flow. Sonic X managed to get me. <laughs> they got me, boys. Why the everlasting fuck do these people decide that getting the prison to fix their machinery was a good idea right after they had Eggman arrested and know that he is good with technology? Do these people actually have a gun for punishment? Are they actively finding reasons to make sure that Eggman is a threat even when he's at his lowest point? Have these people learned anything from the last 33 episodes? Hmm? Hmm? Oh, thank heavens, this was a lot better than the last arc, but only for the last two episodes. The first three episodes of this arc are really hit and miss, which is quite a common trend in this show now that I'm thinking about it. They're not really terrible, I wouldn't say I was bored while watching these episodes, but they don't leave much of an impact at all. Which is quite annoying, because there's character development contained in these three episodes that I think really should have been carried on to later seasons, the prime example being... Amy. As I have said before, if Sonic X were released nowadays, Amy would be the textbook definition of a simp. So the anime decides to dedicate an episode to Amy and explore why she's so obsessed with Sonic. And knowing that her chances are very quickly fading away, how will she deal with the fact that this quest for love is one that will most likely never happen? Well, the answers were quite interesting. Because in this episode, Amy gets a new perspective about Sonic that she's never really thought about. That thing being, his willingness to save people being so big that he saves people practically every day. And even though he doesn't get rewarded for it, Sonic just doesn't give a shit. He does it because he's just that much of a kind-hearted guy. 
Sam even brings up the theory that Sonic does the saving business so much, it might be possible that he doesn't even remember half the people he saved, and that he doesn't really understand how much of an impact he actually makes on the world. Which, when you think about it, makes a good bit of sense, and it adds a nice little layer of mystery to how Sonic sees Amy herself. Does he see her as a true lover? Highly doubtful. Does he see her as just a friend? Possibly. Or does he see her as just another person he saved a long time ago? Does he see everyone else as that? Is it possible that Sonic is just a kind-hearted druggie? This is a very interesting question that Amy doesn't really have the answer to, and this is where she finally realizes that Sonic is far more complex than what she thought. She now knows that Sonic is not this simple character that she can win the heart over. He's got far more stuff in his life to think about. This development was really good, and she even got a taste of the wind blowing through her face not as a damsel in distress, but as a hero who just saved the day and loves the high the wind gives to her. She finally got to experience what Sonic's life is like almost every day, and the rush of the wind blowing right past her is enthralling. All of this is amazing development to finally have Amy accept who Sonic is and back off from the simping. Or if the show was released nowadays, Amy would just be a lesbian. So the moment she finally sees Sonic, all that development of Amy's character that was very well done throughout this whole episode <laughs> completely fucking vanishes. How did you cross the finish line and still lose? Amy just goes right back to square one, making this entire episode and what it was meant to represent pointless. This episode could have had a lot of impact and it bothers me to no end that it went nowhere. This arc also highlights the best example of Chris's parents really caring about their son and anyone who tries to say that they don't after all this are actively fooling themselves. These two chads dropped everything just to see if their son was alright after he got a fever. I don't care if this is irresponsible, that shit's adorable. Chris, Oh, you ungrateful Brussels sprout! However, the gold lining of this arc is, like what I said before, the last two episodes. Holy shit, these episodes are so good! Aside from the very stupid way they started this arc with the cast once again being bargained with a Chaos Emerald when the humans don't fucking own them. Yes, I am going to drive this point to the ground and no, you can't stop me. There is so much that these two episodes do that make watching them entirely worth it. Firstly, the comedy. It really feels like they hired the writers who did the Chaotix to do these episodes, because the runtime is packed to the brim with so many jokes that 9 times out of 10 resulted in me laughing very hard and having an absolute blast. Chuck warming himself up, everybody roasting Knuckles, the one time Sam's quickly joke landed properly, the super heavyweight match Vulcan roasting the shit out of Amy, Chris having a legitimately great moment with Danny, Sonic asking Chris to intentionally provoke Amy, Chris one-shotting his dad, E77's running joke of winning by using the Luigi strategy, and Tonic being the fucking goat! The jokes in these two episodes are some of the best jokes in the show, and my god, they were so funny. Now. Let's talk about the new character that this saga introduced. Emerald. Emerald, Emerald, yes, I don't, shut up. Emerald throughout this arc showed a lot of good promise. His copying ability was pretty neat, his silent demeanor was quite interesting, and him being cutesy around Cream was some adorable shit. Makes characters objectively better. He may have never spoken a word, but his development from evil to hero was quite solid. And I'm very happy to say that instead of having great development and then having that vanish once it was about to hit its peak like Amy, Sonic X gave Emerald the climactic ending his character deserved. Once he went corrupt after winning the Chaos Emerald, Emerald wastes no time in absolutely leveling not just the tournament area, but the entirety of the city, attacking everything that moves. And not just that, when the Sonic cast try and fight him, Emerald does a great job at showing off his copying ability and wipes the floor with all of them, taking everything that they were good at and throwing it right back at them. He was one of the only Sonic villains in this show that actually made me feel a little intimidated by the sheer power he has over the heroes. The show has a good idea and is giving it the execution it truly deserves. But what made this arc so good was how it ended. 
Sonic and the gang, despite their best efforts, cannot fight back against Emeril. He's an immovable wall being hit with unstoppable force. He's an enemy that they have never faced before. For once, relying on their best abilities completely shatters their hopes of winning. So, the only way he can be beaten is if two characters work as a team. This is where Cream and Cheese come into the picture. Cream throughout the show was a cute character. That was basically all she was. She and Cream were the pureness that made everyone act the best, and she is so cute she can even make robots feel emotion. She was the Sonic cast's little ball of sunshine. So the fact that Sonic X made Cream, a character that up to this point had never thrown a single punch in the entirety of the show, be the one that kills Emerald despite her best efforts, was an idea I never thought they would go with. Taking the most pure and lovable character in the whole anime and having them do something as heartbreaking as taking a corrupt friend's life was a moment in Sonic X that actually made me shed a few tears. I won't lie, this moment hit me really hard. Everything from the animation, the voice acting, Cream trying so hard to get to Emerald but can't, her screaming his name as she lands the killer blow, the imagery in the flashbacks showing the time that they made flowers together, and Emerald copying Cream's tears right before he blows up, all combined into a moment that is one of Sonic X's best. Guys, I really can't stress enough how good these two episodes were. They may just be your typical really short tournament arc, but the ending makes it something truly special, and it makes me very annoyed that the show doesn't have this amount of quality all the way through. Because at long last, some of the flaws that were in the earlier arcs are now being taken out and replaced with actual good shit. Very good Sonic X. I'm impressed. With two of the mini arcs done and reviewed, it's time for the one that I have to slog through before I get to the grand finale. The Homebound Saga, which are episodes 47 to 52. Eggman does the worst kidnapping job in history. Objectively perfect because Tonic fucks! Amy is a simp. Chris is a downright psycho. I'll talk about this later. I'll talk about this later. Oh, oh, that song. Oh, my heart. Okay, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, watch me, I'll do it. I won't lose my mind once. This show can push me, but not now. No, 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 not now. I'll do it. I'll go through this entire part of the review without raising my voice once, starting now. Now then, moving on. The first two episodes of this arc goes back to typical Sonic X fashion of being unmemorable, pointless, schlock. They tried to do the story of there being an old ancient civilization that once was amazing and has technology far beyond that of modern times. It got destroyed, it's lost under the sea, yada yada yada. You've seen this story a million times before and they don't make much changes here. It's as predictable and as boring as you can get. I swear to you, I've seen this show like three times and I still barely remember what happened. Giant mechs? Check. New metal that was never discovered before? Check. Also, come on. Calling this place Marasia. Was Atlantis not free domain in 2003? But fear not, dear viewer. As opposed to having just a boring arc like the Chaos Saga not too long ago, this arc is filled with the added dumb shit that Sonic X likes to implement. Like Eggman kidnapping a large portion of Guns' troops, only to find out he never took their weapons away from them. Why the captured troops didn't do anything is beyond me, but it gets worse, just wait. In any other show, this would be the moment where he would be arrested right then and there, but this is Sonic X people. They don't play by the rules. So the way he escapes is by doing this. I have seen Looney Tunes shows that are more consistent than this. I was watching this alongside a friend, and he actually pointed out a plot hole that went right over my head the first two times I watched it. The way this story kicked off was that, in a nutshell, Knuckles found this very ancient map that leads to the lost continent of Marasia and contains the location of the world's belly button. This map was then sent to a museum to be studied. This map was then posted online for all the world to see, which was how Eggman was notified of its existence. Eggman then sends Boko and D go to get the map, 
But why though? Why would he go through the effort if he could just get the map online? Why did he even bother stealing the map in the first place? What would he have gained from having the original map? Look, I do understand that Eggman is a villain, but wouldn't it have been smarter and more interesting if he just used the internet against the humans and tried to awaken the Earth's belly buttons under everyone's nose? Don't you think that would have been a bit more riveting to watch? But no, you gotta make sure the humans always know exactly what you're up to. Makes total sense to me. Now that we're on the subject of plot holes for once, a lot of them have been pretty terrible. Right? Sonic X, I would say, has been fairly broken up to this point. The show contradicts its own story so much, if you were to make it a drinking game, your chances of surviving would be next to none. But then, episode 49 happens. This one just opened. Pandora's box. Let's dive right in, shall we? In episode 49, the show decides to give us a plot twist. That twist being, the human world and Sonic's world used to be one. So here's how the twist goes, word for word. For some reason, it's split into two different worlds and dimensions. That means each world has a different timeline. The worlds are now reunited, so the timelines are also reuniting. If we do nothing, the two timelines will interfere with each other and eventually freeze. In other words, time will die. And the only way to fix this disaster from happening is to have all the emeralds again and build a machine that can use chaos control and send everything home. Let's unpack this, shall we? My first question is why is it that it has only started happening now? I ask this because of one character, Eggman. It has been established that he was born in the human world thanks to the anime's adaptation of Sonic Adventure 2. If he was born in the human world, wouldn't him being on Mobius cause time to freeze? Does it have to be multiple things, or can it just be one person that manages to mess up time as a whole? It's way too fucking vague on how much the worlds have to combine in order for time to just cease from existence. This also raises another question of how Eggman got to Mobius in the first place. How did he get there? When did he get there? How did he even know of his existence from the stars? That's some pretty vital information, but the show just never explains it. So I just have to assume that either Eggman's existence for some reason doesn't count, <coughs> or that more realistically, the writers just kind of forgot that twist from the Shadow Saga and moved on like Eggman's existence doesn't completely contradict this new narrative. In addition, this makes Shadow's appearance very strange, because if Mobius and Earth were split up, how in God's name did they manage to make Shadow look like well, this. It was wildly convenient that he looked somewhat like Sonic from the game before, but now it makes no sense as to why exactly he looks like a Mobian, when Gerald Robotnik most likely had no idea that they even existed. What, did Maria want a fursona or something? Nani the fuck? And lastly, the Chow. Don't they count as well? Wouldn't their mere existence make time die because there are loads of them on Earth? Or are Chow that special breed that somehow exists both on Earth and on Mobius? When I really thought about it, this whole separate world bullshit makes no sense. I understand that they wanted to come up with a reason to make Sonic and the boys go back to their world, but the questions it ended up raising destroyed all of the stakes this twist wants to have. There is also Chris, being the world's biggest creep and quickly becoming the most unlikable character in the show, but I'll hold it off for now. He'll get it soon enough. So to recap, episode 47 to 49 have been a mixture of dumb and boring adventures, with the only real good thing being Tanaka being an absolute chad and waving around the biggest of dick energy. But then, we reach episode 50. <sighs> I made a promise. I can do this. Episode 50 was meant to be a closure to the human world shenanigans. In the beginning of the episode, the president gives a heartfelt speech about how much Sonic and his friends helped the world and that they will never forget the memories they have of them, sending them off like true heroes. Intentionally leaving out that time they distrusted Sonic not once but twice, one being done by his arch rival and enemy to the world, constantly getting in his way and taking ownership of the Chaos Emerald, something that never belonged to them in the first place. But like episode 50 being a closure to the human shenanigans, be happy lads. Because episode 50 is now the closure of this running joke. Not only does this speech come off as super fucking fake after all I have seen the humans do to our heroes, the people of Earth have one final trick. 
up their sleeves. That comes in the form of a last minute villain, a general who wants Sonic and Eggman destroyed so that humankind can go back to the way they were. I could have mentioned this plot point in the last arc because that's where it started, but I decided that I would save it for this one because this is where this whole storyline gets a conclusion, plus it wasn't important to the last saga. Back in episode 43, the storyline went like this. People were becoming more and more influenced by Sonic's fast, carefree attitude. Jogging was becoming more popular. People were relaxing more and more. World records were being broken left and right. This new phenomenon was titled the Freedom Movement. The General's motivation is that Eggman isn't being taken as seriously as he should be, and that people are getting more and more lazy thanks to Sonic. So that's why he wants both of them gone. While it may seem that the people were getting lazier, the fact that world records are being broken to a point where the number of records broken became a record in itself kinda contradicts that. You can't exactly say that beating the fastest times were done out of laziness. Though hey, the person in first place was white, so what do I know? Also, since it has been shown what can happen if they leave the prison to do the handiwork, I'm sure the people learned the risks of that and went back to work. So this villain being here is not only really weird filler, but it concludes a storyline that was already kind of over. The timeline twist tried to use the freedom movement as evidence of the time stagnation shit, and that, that just makes no sense at all. Like, oh no. People are becoming increasingly more chill. Th th that obviously means that time is slowly dying around us. Kind of a leap in logic, but alright. But, this closure wasn't the worst of what episode 50 had to offer. Oh, no, 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 no. Strap in, ladies and gentlemen. Do you want to know why I promise not to raise my voice at the beginning of this part? This was the reason. After getting the chip from Eggman that will complete the machine to get them home, because Eggman somehow knew exactly what to build for Tails and Chuck without even knowing they were building such a device, but whatever, the machine manages to work and all the Sonic characters are sent home. Emotions are high, character arcs get closures, and everything is looking to be bittersweet. I'd be lying in saying that some of the scenes didn't make me almost tear up. So far, it's fairly good. Right now, this is a good ending to this story. And then, it's finally time for Chris to say goodbye to Sonic. This is it. This is meant to be Chris's moment. After 50 episodes of being with Sonic, Chris finally has to let Sonic go, symbolizing the end of his character arc. And all was going well. But instead... <laughs> His character arc grinds to a screeching fucking halt. Ooh, this episode fucking broke me. They did it. They finally did it. There was a line, and this show just fucking crossed it. Throughout the story, Chris had to get lectures from a couple of different characters, the main ones being Mr. Stewart, his Uncle Chuck, and Eggman about letting Sonic go. These scenes were to build up to the moment in episode 50 when Chris has to accept that Sonic is no longer going to be with him. He will have to live a life without him, and despite that being sad, that's perfectly okay. And that moment was to show us that he's finally developed as a character. He was now mature. He's now, dare I say, likable. I cannot believe that after everything Chris was told, everything Chris had to learn, everything that was building up to Chris finally maturing as a character, just stops for a quick subversion of expectations, just so that the show can add another episode of Chris being the most unlikable piece of shit in the whole anime. Don't you dare show me just 41 seconds of Chris being all sad and lonely from his childhood because I'm not fucking buying it. You had your chance to explain this shit throughout those 50 episodes and you failed. There is no reason as to why he is so clingy towards this blue passive piece of fandom filth. Episode 51 should not have happened. It shouldn't. It just shouldn't. It goes against everything that Sonic was building up to, and to make Chris do this after knowing that time itself is in jeopardy and that this is Sonic's only chance to go home, and to have the gall, the absolute fucking nerve, to have Chris wonder why Sonic isn't angry at him after what he just did is a level of rage-filled stupidity that would get me kicked off YouTube if I was to put it into words. So let me condense them for you. Fuck these two episodes. 
Fuck these two episodes. Fuck these two episodes. All right. I'm good now. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. All is fine. All is ripe with the world. At least, after this dumpster fire of two episodes, I can at least talk about episode 52. Which, to be honest, is fairly well done. Episode 52 has all the jokes. It has all the wholesomeness. It has all the characterization that makes me like watching the show when it's good. And Amy's reaction to Sonic coming back, while still a little bit simpish, actually hit me pretty hard, with the song being one that hits me in all the right feels. This scene was extremely well done. I might not agree with this on Amy's ship, but I can see why people find this as evidence to the thing being official. It's an adorable scene. It's all around a decent ending to what is, in my opinion, the worst saga of the whole series. And we're at the final stretch. It's now time to review the saga that made Sonic X go from okay in some people's eyes to something that ended up being pretty good. That being the Metarex Saga, which are episodes 53 to 78 making this the longest saga out of them all. Cosmo destroys Mobius because she- WHY ARE YOU BACK?! Adult Chris would have been much more interesting. Sonic has complicated relationships with water. Amy's a strong simp. Being deceived is better than to deceive. OW! WHAT THE- This was all for nothing. Thanks for wasting my time. <laughs> I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going. The chaotic fuck yeah! <laughs> well, that was bullshit. Okay, I admit it. Cosmo and Tails are cute. They decided to use not one, but all the emeralds. Sonic Roasting Shadow was the only good part. Chaotix, fuck yeah! Ugh, this one was so dull. Dark Sonic left an impact, but only for two seconds. Holy shit. Amy is a simp. Plot convenience was through the roof in this one. Fucking chaotic, baby. That, that was dark. Okay, now we're talking. <whistles> <laughs> the Metarx just got infinitely more interesting. Fire Station Project's big reveal is Discount King Ghidorah. Eh, Black Knight did it better. Fuck. Fuck. Okay, Sonic X, you've done a lot of something. There is a lot to talk about here. Now that the humans are finally out of the picture and Sonic can finally be with the gang alone. Oh, you fuck! The show decides to explore the beauties and the worries of the world of Mobius by immediately unleashing an intergalactic threat with a new alien race who then steals the planet's life source and make the characters immediately go to space. You know, I would have liked to see how Mobius worked, but I guess I'll never know. My disappointment, thrown to the wayside, the Metarex arc is quite special in that it actually makes me feel anger not just towards Chris or any of Sonic's friends at the beginning. Trust me, I'll be getting to Chris later. <laughs> Don't think I'm one to just skip a Chris round whenever I get the chance. But that for the second time in all of the show's history, I actually felt quite annoyed at the actions committed by Sonic. The way the arc kicks off is Sonic fighting this unknown new enemy named Dark Oak. This is also the very first time where we actually see Super Sonic tired and even slightly hurt. Already, the stakes have been raised by a lot and Dragpoke's presence is one to admire. So far, it's going pretty good. But then, Sonic decides that rather than just keep fighting, instead thinks that the best solution to this current predicament is to launch all seven Chaos Emeralds into space, shutting down every chance he had at beating Dooku and falls to Earth defeated. This not only makes it certain that Dakak has a golden chance to kill him, but everyone else's chance of beating him have now been completely squandered. Sonic just went 
full on galaxy brain in this moment? The only reason he survived this very brain dead decision was because Doc Ock conveniently didn't attack him. Despite having all the power in the world to do so, the show attempts to explain this absolute nonsense decision by claiming that Darko's chances of winning at that moment was very low. Bitch! <laughs> Yeah, right after Sonic blew the Chaos Emeralds away from him and is clearly falling to Earth. Completely unconscious. Buddy, I don't care if you got hit with one of the Emeralds, you could poke Sonic's unconscious body and have him drift out into the dark depths of space without even trying. But alright, show, alright, whatever you say. If you thought what I just said was dumb, strap on in because this is only the start. Say hello to Cosmo the Cedrian, X's new addition to the Sonic lore. She is the lone survivor of an attack from the Metarex not too long ago. Her whole purpose at the start is to warn Sonic about the Metarex attacking Mobius, stealing his planet's egg, and asking if he will fight the Metarex. The reason why the planet egg is so important is because without it, Mobius would slowly become an inhabitable wasteland and life on the planet would be no more. In simple terms, Egg gone, death slot. So it's quite important that she relays this news to him as fast as possible. But she's very committed to telling only Sonic, because even though she knows this planet's remaining lifetime was cut drastically fucking short, she refuses to tell anybody else about the problem, until all the damage she was worried about happening to this planet is done. Which just kinda makes her saying I must protect this planet right after everything that went down, can I just really rub salt in the wound? <laughs> What the fuck, bro? These guys could have known what they were up against if you just decided to move your plant-ridden lip flaps, you fucking cabbage. This combined with Sonic's brain-dead decision-making has right now made this arc start on a really bad foot. But just when you think it couldn't get any worse, the Master Emerald begins to glow, and a familiar face pops out. <gasps> oh, come on! Yep, Chris is back. All right then, where do I start? Oh yeah, why the fuck are you back? Sonic X, you went through 51 episodes of Chris being around and growing with Sonic and the boys, making him go through a character arc that made it so that Chris, at the end of the last saga, finally grew up and let Sonic go. Chris then lived a good and fulfilled life for the next six years, with the possibility of being in a relationship with Helen, depending on which dub you watch. Chris's story was over. You let him go a little bit too late, but you managed to do it, and I was totally fine with it. So why, on God's green earth, did they decide that that character development Chris went through should be completely fucking retconned, and have Chris, after all that he learned from his past, go to Sonic's world and make it so that not only does he not know how he's going to get back, but also not allow anyone else to follow him. Chris didn't even talk to anybody about his journey to Mobius, he just straight up left his friends and his family, people he has been with since his childhood, leaving only a note with a piss poor explanation as to why he did it. Chris as a character just went all the way back to square one with only minor differences. That journey he went through for 50 odd episodes? Eh. That meant nothing. Honestly, you could have just skipped it. He didn't learn shit. His obsession with Sonic never truly went away, after all. He spent six years of his life getting the teleporter to work again, and once it started up, he didn't even think twice about leaving all of his life on Earth behind. <laughs> I was already pissed off with how the story handled Chris in episode 51, but in that episode's defense, it at least tried to make you feel sorry for Chris, it tried to make it seem like he regretted what he did, it at least tried to show that Chris's arc was over. But episode 53 just pops up and goes, nah, lol, fuck you viewer, Chris is back now, embrace it! He's never going away. Episode 51 was already my least favorite episode of the show, but now that episode 53 showed me that everything episode 51 was trying to show me meant absolutely fuck all after all this time, makes me now completely despise it with all my heart because now I know I could have just skipped Chris's arc and nothing would have changed. What the fuck, Sonic X? Seriously, what the fuck? The show attempts to do this complete ass pull that the reason why Chris came back wasn't just because he wanted to see Sonic again, but it was also because Chris had a feeling that Sonic was in danger. 
So why the fuck did he go alone? Don't you think that if Sonic was in supposed danger, he would tell his peeps about it and give them the opportunity to possibly help out? How in the hell do you expect to help Sonic all by yourself after all the stuff you've seen and experienced firsthand? You'd think that shit would have sunk in, but no, I guess it didn't. On top of this mountain of character development bullshit, there is another problem with Chris coming back. Now, viewer. Do I need to remind you on what happened in the last arc? Now, I could be completely wrong, I'm not always right, but I vividly remember a perfectly good reason as to why it was so important to make sure Mobius and Earth were separated. Wasn't that reason that if these worlds were to merge, time would die, and if Chris and more objects from his world were to come to Sonic's world, wouldn't that technically put time in jeopardy once again, meaning that Chris, upon going to Mobius, damned not just the two worlds, but time itself? No way. We created it. No. It's totally made up. I'm wrong. You're wrong. It's a total fabrication. It's a made-up tale. We got you. I guess that could be an argument as to why Chris went alone in hopes to lessen the risk, but considering the vagueness of what counts and what doesn't, making Chris still decide to go through with this plan is still a really stupid move. So, you can be as vague as you want with the technicalities, but I'm not fucking buying it. You done goofed. You've lost. Good day, sir. The final thing that makes this plot point annoying and also a bit pointless is because Chris is not his own character here. Back in the earlier arcs, he was a kid with abandonment issues, but here, he's an inventor who makes some shoes for Sonic every now and again, helps out when it comes to making the plans, and is a character that on occasion has to explain the technobabble so that the audience can keep up. He's basically season one Tails, so he doesn't really have a defining trait that makes him stick out from the cast. Which kind of makes my next point a bit ironic, because upon stealing the personality of another character, Chris is now actually tolerable in this season. I'll be straight with you, he actually didn't bother me anywhere near as much as last time. Hell, he even gets one or two good moments. I've now just hit a revelation upon recording this. This is only after two episodes. <laughs> we still have like 25 to go. This arc is seriously a mess of storytelling. Not only did this story start off on the worst of feet, but what I think made this arc suffer a lot in many instances was all the times that the show wanted to do something that came off as smart, <clears throat> but then did that thing in the worst way possible. If what I just said sounded like techno babble, I'll give a few examples. In episode 63, Sonic and Eggman decide to team up in order to infiltrate a heavily guarded Metarex base because the last two emeralds are inside. So they call it a truce and go off with this plan. Rouge, Shadow, and Chris are to destroy the defenses from the inside with chaos control, and the rest will do a free-for-all to get the last two emeralds. <laughs> At this point in the story, Sonic and the boys have three emeralds, and Eggman has two. Eggman, throughout this whole saga, while not being the main villain, is still very untrustworthy. He has proven on multiple occasions that he is a backstabbing piece of shit. So the Sonic characters, knowing that this guy is working with them, should be very on guard with their three emeralds, making sure that Eggman can't get his hands on them. But rather than just using one Chaos Emerald to get inside, because it's been shown before that you only need one Chaos Emerald to find another one, they instead decide to bring all of the emeralds they have with them, making Eggman's backstabbing job a million times easier. Of all the people who should have a Chaos Emerald, why did Amy and Cosmo take one? They could just follow Sonic and Knuckles, and even then, why do Sonic and Knuckles have two emeralds with them? They could have just used the one Knuckles was holding. It just raises too many questions. Another example is in episode 67, where the crew get a message from the Metarex themselves, and Cosmo volunteers to read it out for them. While they already have a translation machine with them, having Cosmo read it out creates more tension, I get it, moving on. As it seems like Cosmo read the last of the message, she utters a PS, which later on is revealed to be a message directed towards her. Chris questions her briefly, but eventually Cosmo leaves and no one has a second thought. Cosmo then proceeds to go galaxy brain mode and fly a spaceship supposedly alone to talk to the Metarex herself. 
and shockingly gets herself caught because this is the Metarex. This is their enemy we're talking about here. Now, this is an interesting plot point, have Cosmo go to the Metarex and fall for their trap. But again, Sonic X did this horribly for a variety of different reasons. For one, the characters have a translation machine. After Cosmo becomes very suspicious with the PS, the crew should not have wasted any time in translating the message themselves. Giving this message to the crew was already a ballsy move by the Metarex, so to have Cosmo be the one that reads it out, and not have the Sonic characters check the message themselves was a massive coincidence. Two, Chris deciding to go with Cosmo without telling anyone else what he is doing, even going as far as to turn off the bridge sensor so that the gang can't detect him. This is one of Chris's moments that is just... Why? Why did Chris go with Cosmo alone? What did he think he could have possibly achieved by himself? Not only has he put himself and Cosmo in catastrophic danger, but now Chris just severed their one chance of being rescued, making him and Cosmo sitting ducks for what's about to come. Chris ended up translating the message and didn't tell anybody else about it. Why? Which then makes the whole twist of the whole thing being a trap lose all of its stakes because Cosmo's hero complex was too high and Chris was too stupid to tell anybody about what he planned to do. I'm actually annoyed that no one called him out on this. This was really, really stupid. Which nicely transitions to my third example of what I'm talking about, where after the team find out what the thorns and their sides got themselves into, Sonic goes and confronts the Metarex only to see Chris unconscious and Cosmo injured. Sonic would usually be able to do something, but in this instance, his hands are tied as Chris and Cosmo slowly fall to the floor. As Black Narcissus continues to taunt Sonic, gloating at the fact that Sonic is helpless, a new form of Sonic emerges. Dark Sonic. The first time we've ever seen him, truly angry. Now, this is a very interesting development for Sonic. Throughout the entirety of the show up to this point, he was seen as being passive, chill, cocky, and overall had a very upbeat view on life. He always talks with a lot of spirit and a lot of personality. And while he got himself into plenty of tight spots before, Sonic's attitude never changed. He always ended the trip with a smile or a positive message at the end. That carefree attitude helped him out. But in this instance, however, Sonic for the first time experiences true helplessness. There's no spinning this into a positive ending. He's stuck. He's alone. Chris and Cosmo are prisoners that he cannot save, and he can't defeat the villain that's right in front of him. So for a minute, his attitude completely changes. Instead of looking at the villain while they talk, he keeps his eyes at the ground where he last saw his friends. Instead of the usual one-liners and witty comebacks in his loud voice, he asks direct questions with a super quiet, demanding tone, almost like he's trying his best to conceal his rage. And when Black continues to taunt him, he doesn't respond. When Black shows him his two robots, showing Sonic that he sees him more as a lab rat than anything else, Sonic is brought to his breaking point. He allows himself to shout, but only for a second. And after he destroys the robots, his voice goes back down to a chilling whisper, his pupils completely gone as he allows his anger to take over. For the first time, the show allows Sonic to actually lose his cool. And it's pretty intense. This scene would have probably been one of my favorites because of how well done it was. But then... The show realized that continuing this side to Sonic's character would require a thing called effort. So instead of biting down and seeing where this could take them, this interesting development for Sonic completely vanishes after this episode and is never brought up again, making this incredibly riveting plot point pointless. These three examples, I believe, highlight the moments where this season's writing was badly done. All of these moments had lots of potential to be something great, but the way that they were executed did not do them any favors at all. This saga also suffers from pacing issues as well, with some episodes either being way too long or just filler to make this season longer, making some adventures that they go on feel like a waste of time. The episode involving the cancerous planet was a prime example of what I'm on about. And like the seasons that came before it, there are also a plethora of moments that were quite bad. If you've been watching up to this point, you know where this is going. Let's start off with just some goofs and gradually transition to the stupider moments. Tails asking if Cosmo is okay with fighting the robot when he's right about to jump into the fight with Cosmo in the passenger seat. Eggman being able to send ships from other sides of the universe, but doesn't have good enough security on his own ship to find out Rouge snuck on board. 
How she managed to do this without getting caught is a question that was never answered. Scrum Diddly Duckles being tricked by Eggman for the third time in the show. I understand that Knuckles is gullible, but after a second time, this just should not have happened. Chris not recognizing his grandfather's spaceship until after attacking it. Nobody hearing or seeing Deco and Boko putting hacker chips on their ships even when they are in the character's peripheral vision. You can't even argue tunnel vision on this one, because even with tunnel vision, the characters still should have seen them. Sonic losing against the Metarex soldiers despite having three Chaos Emeralds with him. Oh, we doing a dog pile? Oh, heck yeah, dog pile? Heck yeah, dog pile. <laughs> Tails explaining why there are palm trees on the ship because Chuck told them that he needed palm trees to fly through outer space. You know, Tails, you could just say that you like them for aesthetic reasons. There's nothing wrong with that. Shadow going on the hero ship in an attempt to kill Cosmo and never telling Sonic and the gang why he's doing it. This episode's really good and all, but if Shadow just explained why he wants to kill Cosmo, it would have made this a lot easier. The Chaotix along with Shadow making their way onto Dot Pop's main ship and getting inside without triggering any alarms. Either this is really dumb or Dork Oric is just so confident that no one will be stupid enough to do this. No humans can get through the teleporter, but objects are completely fine. Either everything goes to the teleporter, or nothing goes to the teleporter. Make up your mind. And on top of that, the objects that Chris's parents send to him appear on the altar in Angel Island, rather than appearing on the ship that contains the Master Emerald. How were they able to send stuff to Chris from Earth? Chris explains that he linked up to the Master Emerald's energy. But the Master Emerald was in space at the time of the stuff arriving. So if the teleporter is still linked to the Master Emerald, wouldn't all that stuff the Thorndike sent be on the Blue Typhoon and not on Angel Island? This, like many other moments, was never explained. In episode 74, the Metarex find out that Eggman has been stealing information from them, and for some reason, don't kill him. I get that Eggman helped them out, but this is the Metarex we're talking about. These guys have killed millions of people and hundreds of planets, so why are they keeping Eggman alive as a prisoner besides plot convenience? They have a lot of his tech, he's pretty much dead meat now. But the biggest, and in my opinion, the stupidest plot point that I want to mention, is the last big twist of the whole saga. It is revealed that Cosmo has been in fact an unintentional spy for Dark Gyoki, and has been his eyes and ears ever since she appeared on Mobius to the time this twist was revealed, with Duke Awoko later saying that everything that has happened in this saga all went exactly to plan. The way this twist was revealed was very effective, it had that nice punch a good plot twist would have, but when you really think about it, this twist is so fucking stupid. So you mean to tell me that all this time, Lucas Ukas had full access to what was going on with the crew pretty much 24-7. All their plans, all their strategies, what else have you? This pretty much means that at any time, he could have just killed them without them even knowing it. This moment, he knew about it. This moment, he knew about it. This moment, he knew about it. This moment right here, sure as shit he fucking knew about it. The Metarex were shown to be cruel, heartless, and above all, ruthless they would do anything they can to get the upper hand. They have shown on multiple occasions that they do not care about casualties if it means that they can win. And considering that Sonic and his friends are the biggest threat to his plan going wrong, Drax Oax, knowing that Cosmo is around them at every crucial moment, should have wasted absolutely no time in making sure that they were wiped off the face of the universe. So how, in the name of God, did these guys survive for this long? Logically speaking, they should have died many times over. This would have all made complete sense if Dark Ox was shown to be this sadistic bastard who loved the chase and has a very prideful personality, but he was never shown to have that. In this whole saga, he was shown as being cunning and cruel, quiet and careful, collected and ruthless. So this twist, rather than making him come off as this super intimidating villain, instead makes him look like a complete fucking idiot who doesn't even follow his own logic. This didn't all go according to plan, my guy. The reason you ended up somewhat succeeding and becoming a lame Godzilla ripoff was because you got extremely fucking lucky. So, yeah, the Metarex arc in short is a colossal mess in terms of its plot. There are just far too many questions raised that were never answered, and there were so many moments that are either really stupid, completely pointless, or very badly executed. But with that said, I would be lying if I said that the whole arc was bad. 
Because it certainly wasn't. In my honest opinion, the Metarex Saga when good is right behind the Emerald Saga in terms of quality, and there is a lot of moments that stood out to me as being some of X's best. So, for the first time over the course of this retrospective, I will actually list out these handful of moments just like how I did with the bad moments. So let's begin this absolute change up in attitude with my first bit of praise, the Chaotix. Like the arcs before, whenever the Chaotix are around, they completely steal the show. I don't know what it is, but it feels like the show lets the best writers they have do Chaotix episodes, and they're always a delight to watch. They still have their great sense of humor, their jokes are now 10 times funnier, and the antics they get up to are some of my most fond memories of the show. Vector's constant delusion and being an absolute chad for the boys, Espio being the voice of reason, and Charmy being the annoying little brat like always, the three amigos still have their charm and lightning fast wit from before, with Espio being responsible for absolutely breaking me with this one action. <laughs> the episode where they try and get Tails and Cosmo together for the entire duration of it was some really good shit. Two, the Metarex actually turned out to be a lot more interesting later on. There's a really nice backstory to how the Metarex came about, and it gave to Pook Pook some nice needed development. The fact that all this started over a betrayal was some really interesting shit. 3. It seems like the animation received a massive upgrade from the other arcs because this season looks a lot better now. Fight scenes now flow better and have more weight with the fights now being upped in scale and impact like the final battle and the occasions when Zelkova is around. The expressions on the characters feel far more varied and much more lively than previous seasons, with the show doing a great job at sometimes getting the message across by just having the audience look at the character's expression and without using any dialogue. Backgrounds look infinitely more detailed and polished, allowing the world to be much more creative visually, and they take every opportunity to show you the 3D model of the Blue Typhoon, which yes, looks pretty nice. And the way they animate it flying through space is usually very smooth and effective. The upped animation definitely helps in making the more somber and emotional moments of the anime hit exactly like they should. Which nicely transitions to my next bit of praise. The Metarex arc is not afraid to do a lot of risky stuff like sacrifice, death, and loss. Which while some moments come off as comically bad, a lot of it actually hits exactly like it's intended to. These moments specifically are where Sonic X shines the brightest for me. When they get these moments right, they get them right. With a lot of episodes of this arc being some of my favorites. Let's list off a few emotional moments that I thought were particularly noteworthy. Example 1. Zelkova's death. After being hit with the shocking revelation that the big four bosses were actually the same species as Cosmo this entire time, Zelkova goes out in the darkest way possible. Everything from Zelkova's cries of pain to Knuckles trying to save the guy that just seconds ago was trying to kill him, this was a really nice dark moment for the anime, adding far more suspense and lore to the Metarex themselves. Example 2, Shadow in episode 53. The entire premise of this episode is that Shadow is out to kill Cosmo, and every single character gets their ass fucking handed to him, with the last character between him and her is none other than Tails, the one character that stands absolutely no chance in beating Shadow, at least, not head on. This episode was really fucking intense. Every time it seems like things are going well, they almost instantaneously go wrong. The whole episode is just this one giant game of cat and mouse, with Tails having to use everything he knows about the Blue Typhoon just to keep Shadow at bay. Tails only wins in this episode thanks to using his brain and trapping Shadow inside the Sonic Cannon. He didn't even stand a chance at beating Shadow head on. This and combined with Tails finally opening up to Cosmo when you have an episode that is all around really well done. Even if thinking about the twist at the end makes you realize how dumb it is. Example 3. Tails' development. Tails for most of this show has been riding behind the coattails of Sonic and the gang, with the only thing he supplied for the story so far were an exposition dumps and occasionally being the extra platform for Sonic to just jump back into the action. In this arc however, Tails has to take on the role of the team's strategist and the team's leader, coming up with plans on the fly in sometimes very dire circumstances. He grows from being this naive big brain child who always idolized Sonic, to becoming a pretty hardened warrior, with the anime showing him having many moments of being his own version of badass, like taking out a snake Metarex with a giant wire, figuring out how to escape the Metarex on one or two occasions, and single-handedly takes on Shadow and wins, like what I said before. 
Tails goes from being Sonic's cheerleader and mechanic to being his own character that stands on his own two feet, even managing to win the heart of Cosmo. Which while not being the most fluid of relationships, it was still really cute whenever the two talked and worked together. Their chemistry was handled pretty well and transitions to the next example of some of the few great moments in this arc. Example 4, the final two episodes. If there was one thing I didn't expect to feel when I rewatched Sonic X for this retrospective, it was to actually feel sad at the shit that was happening. After everything that the Metarex can throw at the Sonic characters to a point where not even their super forms can take them on, Cosmo, a character that for most of the anime has been constantly getting herself in trouble, decides to finally blossom into a useful character one last time, fusing onto the Black Seed and gives the crew one final shot at beating the Metarex. The cost being her life. The one who decides to pull the trigger that will end her is none other than Tails himself. This is the scene that I think did not need to be as good as it was. This, right here, is how you make a death scene emotional. Once Tails is sat all alone in the control panel, all that can be heard is the beeping of the controls. The beep slowly getting louder and louder as the scene drags on. The once lit room is now dark and dreary, with Tails looking at the controls, his hand on the trigger, just waiting to get the signal. As Eggman tells Tails that the time is almost ready, Sonic enters the Sonic Cannon, followed shortly by Shadow, as the two begin to spin dash inside the chamber, building up godly levels of energy. Tails manages to successfully swallow his sadness and tries to push the button, but a few seconds later, he hesitates. The realization on what he's about to do comes in at full throttle, and he breaks down, slamming his head on the control panel in anger. Despite knowing that this is what he has to do to save the universe, he doesn't have the strength to push the button. He doesn't want to. He just can't. Tails begins to cry for real, and during his angered outburst of sadness, berating Cosmo for making a promise she now can't fulfill, Eggman now has to talk Tails into doing it, telling him that he can't allow Cosmo's sacrifice to go to waste, that he must know how she feels after being around her for so long. But Tails still can't do it. In an act of reassurance, Cosmo talks to Tails in spirit, apologizing to him for all the trouble she caused, and asks him to shoot her. She knows what he has to do. So Tails, after just about giving up, swallows his pride and in the act of shooting Cosmo, shouts one final message to her that the audience will never hear. Because as he screams his lungs out, the ending credits music plays, with no other sound effects playing, allowing the music to illustrate the sadness and the tragedy of this moment. Tails managed to do it. He managed to shoot Cosmo. And in a last act of farewell, Cosmo comes back to him in spirit once again, and the last word spoken from Cosmo was to Tails, I love you. I will not lie with you. This scene really got to me. Everything about it, from the voice acting to the animation, was pretty much perfect. I may shit on this show a lot, and it may seem like I really fucking hate it, but I give so much credit to Sonic X for making me care about Cosmo at least once, in a scene that I think was perfectly executed. So well done, Sonic X. Well done. You managed to make the stone-cold heart feel something. But, X is not done. This moment's sadness just gets exemplified in episode 78, with Sonic going up to Tails and giving him a seed, the last remaining part of Cosmo. Tails' reaction to getting this seed was what came close to breaking me. Despite the good intentions that Sonic had when he gave Tails the seed, he doesn't thank Sonic for this. Instead, he just weakly hits him over and over, berating Sonic for him not saving her. 
Why was Cosmo the one that Sonic couldn't save? Why did she not get a second chance when everyone else did? Tails had faith that Sonic would save Cosmo. He believed in him. And this is all Sonic can give back to him. A seed. Nothing else. In addition, Sonic's lack of reaction also makes this moment heartbreaking. There's no bullshitting his way out of this one. There's nothing he can say that will lessen the blow of what Tails just did. The only thing he can do is stand there, saying nothing as Tails breaks down in tears at his feet, his eyes shut in shame for not saving the one person that meant so much to his best friend. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Alright. Whew, this got way too real, way too quick. But I would say that this moment wouldn't have been so good if it wasn't for the final and my favorite example on what I want to bring up about this saga. That example is my favorite episode to come out of this arc, episode 68. In this episode, the show follows Rouge, Eggman, and Shadow on their own solo adventure, where they bump heads with a group of human freedom fighters that come from a dying planet due to the Metarex stealing their planet's egg. After seeing what Shadow was capable of doing, this small group of survivors end up praising their efforts and treat them as being special guests, with Eggman taking full advantage of the spotlight because, of course he does. Meanwhile, the show introduces us to a new character named Molly, who takes a great interest into Shadow as he reminds her of an old legend that she was told of a warrior who could stand up to anything a long time ago. Molly is the character that left the biggest impression on me throughout this episode. Whilst every other character has doubts on beating the Metarex, with some even going as far as to join them behind her back, Molly is the leader that even despite having all the odds set against her, still has this unbreakable optimism. She genuinely believes that her planet can win. She genuinely believes that she stands a chance against the Metarex. She genuinely thinks that continuing to fight for her cause is the one true way to keep on living. She never bows down to the Cosmic Overlords, despite that being extremely foolish. She has the blind optimism that makes her a naive but great leader, with this optimism inspiring more people than just her teammates, always doing her best to keep up the team's morale during a time of desperation to survive. So when she finds out that the team she spent her life fighting with tried to get rid of her in an explosion just so that they can stop fighting and losing more members, even attempting to join the Metarex so that they would be spared from death, Molly, despite being crushed at the betrayal of her teammates, never gives up hope. She loses everything she believes in and everyone she trusted in the span of a couple of minutes, but despite that, even though she thinks about stepping over the line of defeat, she does not stop moving forward. She doesn't drop her principles. She continues to fight. She continues to try and spark hope into the comrades that gave up on it ages ago. And to prove this, she does one final act of bravery. By flying headfirst into the Metarex's main ship without any hesitation and sacrifices herself with a smile on her face to spark one last bit of hope to her comrades. Her sacrifice was to symbolize to her teammates that they should never give up, that turning against their principles is as good as losing yourself. The moment you drop your fighting and join the oppressors just so that you can live your life easier, you betray everything you stood for. It's better to die with your principles than to live by betraying them. She helped inspire at least one of her friends to continue her legacy. And this death was done incredibly well. The anime decided to not use any music and just have the sound effects, the voice acting, the animation, and the expressions do all the storytelling. With the explosion of Molly's ship and Rouge's shout of horror reverberating into your eardrums. <gasps> Molly 
was the reason this episode was so good. Because of her, everything that made the Metarex so horrifying was on full display. I got to finally see just how much power the Metarex has over the galaxy, winning over comrades not out of respect but by fear of death or worse. I got to see just how much war over a long period of time can drive some people to abandon their principles and commit horrid acts of treason against their own leader just out of desperation for the fighting to stop just so that they can go down easy rather than in a blaze of glory by an enemy that's leagues above them. And what's great about this episode is that it doesn't try to paint Molly's comrades as being evil for betraying her, the episode painted them as being desperate for the Metarex to just leave them alone. Sure, it's cowardly, sure the things they say to Molly is very harsh, sure they go down like pathetic weaklings with no spine, but after everything that they've gone through, you can't exactly blame them for wanting all this suffering to end. There's only so much someone can go through before they finally throw in the towel. Everything that I've just said, in addition to Shadow finally getting a purpose to fight again after Molly's heroic sacrifice, even going as far as to make a grave to commemorate her bravery, Episode 68 was the episode Sonic X needed to have. The anime for too long had not really dived into just how horrifying and cruel the Metarex truly were. So when this episode played out and I saw the suffering, the crushing defeat, the acts of betrayal, and the spark of hope in between a rainstorm of doubt, I finally understood what the Metarex are, and I was so fucking ready to see them die. And after we find out what became of the Resistance, it just made me despise the Metarex even more. Joining the Metarex just so that you can be food for a world with no life for all eternity. Now that is fucking evil. This entire episode is why I believe the moments in episode 78 and 77 hit way harder than before. It was because I knew how dangerous the Metarex were, and that the characters had no other choice but to sacrifice one of their own to finally take this ungodly evil down. Because of episode 68, the bittersweetness of the victory in the ending stung way more than if I never saw it, and I will always appreciate episode 68 for that. It really was what Sonic X needed to be something worth remembering. There is probably a handful of moments I'm missing from this arc that I thought were really good, but the truth is is that if I were to go any deeper into this arc, I wouldn't be able to finish this video. This video already took me forever to finish, leave me alone. But, I will say this. The Metarex Saga, despite its glaring flaws in its plot and some characterization, makes up for those two things in the form of many funny, heartfelt, sad, depressing, satisfying, and all in all, enjoyable moments that I will not be forgetting anytime soon. It is without a doubt the second best arc of the whole show. All in all, I definitely had some fun. And that concludes everything. I'm done. I did my 10 words or less, I went in depth with each arc as much as I could, and I gave most of my grievances along with my praises. So with all of these arcs now reviewed, and now that Sonic X is completely done from my perspective anyway, was the series worth coming back to? On one side, yes, because I now feel at peace with myself that I gave as many thoughts on Sonic X in a video format that allows me to do so, but aside from that, no. I don't think so. Don't get me wrong, when Sonic X decides to be good, it can be a genuinely good series. When the emotional moments are handled properly, it can create scenes that are a real tearjerker, and when it's funny, it can occasionally leave me in tears. But those moments are few and far between. Out of 78 episodes, I can only say that a handful of those episodes were good, with no arc out of the series being consistently good all the way through. There's always an episode that drags the series down. There's always an episode that is boring. There is always an episode that just shatters the story's plot and hopes to be insightful or complex. 
Sonic X's fatal flaw for me is just the lack of consistency. I never knew which episode was going to be bad or which episode was going to keep me hooked. It was always a gamble on what I was going to get. And I don't know about you, but if I was to watch a show that is only sometimes really good, then I wouldn't consider watching it, because I know I could just be watching something else that is worth my time. Let me be completely honest with you. If I didn't make those Everything Wrong With videos two years ago, I probably wouldn't have finished this anime. I'm serious. Getting through some of these episodes was a complete pain. While I do appreciate the show for trying occasionally to be something better than it is, I overall thought this series was a complete mess. I have no nostalgic bias towards this show since I never watched it when I was a kid, and if by some chance you're like me, I don't recommend you watching Sonic X, sub, or dub. There's plenty of other Sonic content for you to enjoy, so don't waste your time with this one. I'm confident in saying that you should just skip this. A handful of great moments do not carry a bad show, and Sonic X is exactly the kind of show I'm talking about. My name is Manga Writer, and at long last, I'm done. Thank you all so much for watching this retrospective. <laughs>